WHIP. And we're back here at Philly's number one college radio station, WHIP. Zach Gelb and Chase Sr. here with you. Getting you ready for game six tonight between the New York Rangers and the Philadelphia Flyers as the Flyers are on the brink of elimination down 3-2 after dropping game five on Sunday up in New York by a final score of 4-2. Now joining us on the hotline is the fill-in play-by-play voice of the New York Hockey Rangers and also the co-host of the Michael K Show 98.7 ESPN New York. And that's the great Don LaGreca, Don on. It's Zach and Chase here in Philly. How are you? Good. How are you guys? Oh, I'm doing great, and it's a do-or-die game tonight for the Flyers. They try to force a Game 7, which would be tomorrow night. And you look at this series, the Flyers and their offensive production, they've been very quiet, especially with their two big stars in Claude Giroux and Wayne Simmons. We know the Rangers are a good defensive team, and they have Henrik Lundqvist in net. But what have you seen out of Giroux and Simmons that made them struggle so much up against the Rangers in their career? I just think you saw what the Rangers are are about, and that's they're six deep defensively. And, you know, McDonough maybe struggled early in this series from an offensive standpoint, but he's still a shutdown defender, and Girardi is as good as it gets to that uh, department. So I thought the Rangers have done a good job of making sure that the studs for Philadelphia just didn't get anything going for the longest time. Giroux, whether it was um, the first three, the last three games of the regular season and the first couple of games of the postseason, couldn't even get a shot on goal. Now, he did have four shots on goal in game five, and he did score a goal with a minute and a half to go. So maybe that may have broken through a little bit, but uh, still the Rangers have done a really good job reducing Philadelphia's opportunities. And the other thing, too, is that when the Rangers are really on, they possess the puck. So sometimes it's difficult for Philadelphia to just be able to get into the Rangers' zone and create opportunities. We had Jim Jackson on a few moments ago, and we were talking about Wayne Simmons. And what makes Wayne Simmons so good in the regular season that we saw this year was his big physical presence in front and his ability to rebound the puck, something you need when you're going up against an elite goaltender in Henrik Lundqvist. Simmons really hasn't been establishing that presence in front of the net. How important is it that he does that tonight if the Flyers want a chance to win this game? Well, it's incredibly important because you know if if Hank can see it, he's going to save it. And the best way to be able to get goals against him is to create havoc. I think Lundqvist usually does a pretty good job when there's traffic in front of him, but you need to be able to deflect. You need to be able to, you know, cut down his line of sight. But the Rangers defense also has done a good job of clearing that zone for him too. So, yeah, that's going to be very, very important. It's not just the number of opportunities, it's the quality of the opportunities, and that's something that the Flyers have really struggled with so far in this series. So if they get power play opportunities, they got to cash in on them, and they really have to try to crowd that net and reduce uh, Lundqvist's ability to see the puck. Don LaGreca joins us right now. Don, it's Chase. Thanks for joining the show. Steve Mason was brilliant in Game 4, 37 saves. In Game 5, he was not as good. How good does Mason need to be tonight to send this series to a Game 7 tomorrow night at MSG? Well, he was he was pretty good in Game um, 4 uh, with the 37 shots. Although the Rangers really seem to think that they didn't believe their quality in those 37 shots were any good, or 38 shots, 37 uh, saves by Mason. But you're right. In Game 5, he gave up that goal to stall, and I thought it was kind of a soft one, and I think that kind of lended to him maybe not having that great a game. He gave up uh, you know, uh, the, the three goals on the 21 shots uh, and, and then the empty netter to make it 4-2 game. Um, I thought it was almost as if Philadelphia had acquired a number one goaltender when he came in for Emery, and that was a huge plus for Philadelphia, and the Rangers probably thought they created a monster uh, after Game 4, but they got to him in Game 5. Remember, this is a guy now that is – only 1-5 in, in postseason games in his career. Remember, he was 0-4 in Columbus. So he probably is wondering right now exactly what he can do confidence-wise. So the Rangers should try to test him early and see if they can maybe get on his bad side and not create the monster that they created in Game 4. How Gill got the nod in Game 5, and he's been around the NHL for a long time. It looks like Eric Gustafson is going to play tonight in his place. Uh, is that going to give the Flyers a- any bit of a- an advantage? Well, it has to, because I, mean, I like Hal Gill. That was his 111th playoff game on Sunday. No goals and six assists. And he obviously screwed up the one turnover that led to the Dominic Moore goal that made it 3 nothing, and when you look at the, the outcome the rest of the way, that ended up being a huge goal for the Rangers. So he's a big presence, a ton of experience, but they need to find another uh, answer there. Uh, for a guy that played only six games all year long, not in the postseason, 
it just didn't make a lot of sense to give him that second opportunity. Gustafson's played in the league for a while and played a lot more games than, than Al Gill did. I think that's the right decision for Philadelphia. We're talking to Don LeGreck of the coast of the Michael K. Show on 98.7 ESPN up in New York. Zach Gelbin, Chase Sr. here with you on WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. Again, you're ready for Game 6 tonight between the Philadelphia Flyers and the New York Rangers. And Don, at Game 3 and Game 4, the Rangers got off to a fast start, especially in those first uh, 10 minutes, and they got that first goal. They won Game 3, they lost Game 4. And in a Game 6, when you're facing elimination, it's imperative for the Flyers to go out there and get that quick start. But you look at the Rangers in the Wells Fargo Center. They've been able to get off to those fast starts. Why do you think that is? I, because I just think the onus always seems to be on the away team. You know, take the team out of it, get off to a really good start. But as we've seen in three of the five games, it doesn't seem to matter who scores first because the team that won, uh, that scored those first goals uh, in three of them didn't win the game. But I, it's just one of those things. I just think that you're a little bit more focused when you're on the road. Rangers have been a, a good road team all year. They broke the franchise record with 25 wins away from Madison Square Garden. So I think that's more of a compliment to the Rangers and their persistence than it is anything wrong with Philadelphia. Um, but Philadelphia can dictate the tone. They get the last change. Uh, it's an energetic building. Um, they can feed off of that. And then the Rangers just have to, that old adage, I know it gets tired to hear, but you know, stem off those first five minutes of emotion and then kind of get back to an even keel. So if I'm Philadelphia, I want to be that team to strike first. I want to keep my my, my team into it. And maybe they'll go back to God Bless America again after they did, uh, you know, in game four. And just try to get the crowd into it, get everybody fired up, and uh, see if they can't get that all-important uh, first goal to just keep that crowd going and just put the Rangers back in their ears. Remember, Rangers, are, Rangers have lost their last 11 consecutive games when taking a lead in the series in the previous game. So – that's got to wear on a team to know that they haven't handled prosperity. They lost both games after taking the lead in the series in this one. So maybe you can catch the Rangers on their heels a little bit by getting off to a good start. That's a major point because in the last three years, and as you know, I'm a Rangers fan. I live in Philadelphia right now. But uh, I've seen this Rangers team play in the playoffs. They went to Game 7 up against the Caps last year. Uh, the year they went to the Eastern Conference Finals, they went to a Game 7 up against Ottawa, Washington, and they got ousted in six by the Devils. I was in the locker room on Sunday. The question was being asked, is there a little bit more pressure on the Rangers up 3-2 just knowing their inability to close out and force a Game 7? I talked to Martin St. Louis uh, yesterday. Now, he wasn't a part of all the history, although he was a part of the two times they've done it in this series, and he claimed he didn't even know the stats. So that kind of tells me he knows, but as a veteran leader, he's trying to keep it away from the guys and having a way on them. The, the fact is, this is a very even series, and you're going to see back and forth, and we shouldn't be surprised we've seen back and forth in this series. So put the history away. That was, you know, over the last couple of years, different players, different temperament of this team. But, of course, there's pressure on them because the last thing you want to do is have a, a crapshoot game seven the very next day. I've always felt that when you have a short turnaround like this, which is rare in the NHL, the team that wins the previous game has an advantage going to the next game because they can ride that wave right into the next day's play. So all that works against the Rangers. That's why I think there is pressure to finish this off. Plus, if you want to think about the Rangers moving on to the second round, Pittsburgh's already wrapped things up. So, you know, the, the quicker the Rangers get this series over with, uh, the more of an even uh, plane they'll be with Pittsburgh in the second round. The last thing you want to do is have to play again uh, on uh, a, 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 a Game 7 situation and have Pittsburgh that much more rested for the second round. So all those factors definitely put, I think, a lot of pressure on the Rangers to finish it off tonight. The rubber hits the ice tonight at the Wells Fargo Center as the Flyers take on the Rangers looking to avoid elimination. And Don, you mentioned Martin St. Louis. Wasn't the most popular trade bringing him in from Tampa Bay, but he's been brilliant in the series. You know, and I thought he was pretty good in the regular season, too. I know he wasn't finishing, and he finished with just a one goal and seven assists for eight points over 19 games, but I thought he was involved. He had a couple of big game-winning assists during the course of the regular season. He just wasn't getting the breaks. Now five playoff games he's got six points he leads the team he's got a couple of goals and he's been here before he was in a conference final a couple of years ago with Tampa he won a cup with them in 2004 the reason that trade wasn't popular and you know you're a Ranger fan Ryan Callahan was one of the most popular Rangers you walk around Madison Square Garden all you see are 24 jerseys but I think the fans have really come to like this guy he's been an, an overachiever his entire career a guy that was undrafted small diminutive in size and got a real chance to become a Hall of Famer just based on persistence. You know, 
New Yorkers love that blue-collar attitude he brings. So now that they've gotten over Callahan being gone, I think Ranger fans are really going to fall in love with this guy. Yeah, I'm actually a Philly fan, so I know St. Louis has done a great job of killing the Flyers over the years. But uh, even in the Flyers' wins in this series, I've seen the Rangers be the better team. Do you expect Berube to make any changes tonight, whether that be on offense or defense, that can help the Flyers get to a Game 7? No, I just don't know what else they can really do. Um, like you said, you brought in Gustafson because that was the right deal as far as Hal Gill's concerned uh, because of uh, the injury to Grossman. But, you know, I just think you keep doing what you're doing. I, I agree with you. I think the Rangers have been the better team in this series. But here we are, 3-2 with Philadelphia having home ice tonight with a chance to even things up. So I think you just work on that. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're home. You get that last change, be feisty, get in the Rangers' face, try to take them out of their game like you did in game four, like, like, excuse me, like you did in game three. And that's why I wonder one of the biggest decisions I think Elaine Vigneault has to make in tonight's game is does he play Daniel Carcillo or does he keep J.T. Miller, who had an assist in game five? Um, I, think, I think he's going to go back to Carcillo, which tells you the Rangers are concerned that that physicality that Philadelphia brings to the table can be a major selling point for Philadelphia to win this game tonight. But if I'm Barubi, I just hope for more shots and, and hope for some power play opportunities because they've been very good on the power play in this series, and they've been very good at home all year on the power play. Zach Gelben, Chase Sr. here with you. A few more questions with Don LaGreca from 98.7 ESPN in New York. And, uh, Don, uh, let's get to Rick Nash. He's been bad in his concise times in the postseason. Hasn't really – he's got the assist, but he hasn't really been able to go out there and bury pucks in the back of the net. Hasn't been able to do it in this series. How far away do you think Nash is from getting a goal? Yeah, I think he's close. I think you saw when they pulled the goaltender in game four, he was good. He had his moments in game five. He's been a streaky player all year. I think if he bends the twine once, he could be a dominant player you know, for the next few games, and that's what the Rangers really hope for. But overall, whether it's Columbus, whether it's the two playoff seasons here, guy's got two uh, playoff goals in his career. And for somebody as dominant a player as he has been in his career, that's just not going to cut it. So he just needs to do a better job of putting himself near the net creating opportunities. I think sometimes I, I hate this backing into the net that he does, um, dealing with the perimeter, not really getting those you know, those dirty goals, trying to be too pretty, too fancy with the puck on the power play. He's got to score some goals. He's, he's such an X-factor, guys, because you acquire Rick Nash, yeah, because you want to finish high in the standings in the regular season, but you acquire Nash because he's going to be a difference maker in the playoffs. He wasn't last year for this team. He hasn't been so far in the first five games here. If this team is going to get out of this series, if this team is going to make any kind of run, they're going to need Rick Nash to start getting some goals. And, and two goals in his playoff career is just not going to cut it for his amount of talent. Richards had a tough postseason last year, and he's really changed his game around, especially in the regular season, had a really good regular season, and he scored in the postseason. What do you attribute uh, to it that had this turnaround with Brad Richards? Because he was almost amnestied, as many fans were calling him, for his head. And he still may be because of the amount of money that he's making, so we'll see. But I think he's used that as incentive. Uh, we had a chance to talk to him on the Michael K. Show a couple of weeks ago, and he blames himself for last year because he just wasn't properly prepared for when the lockout was going to come to an end. If you remember, he got hurt in Europe, came back, wasn't sure when there was going to be any hockey, wasn't mentally or physically prepared for when they solved the CBA, and it really showed in his conditioning throughout the regular season and the playoffs and ended up being a healthy scratch a few times in the Boston series. He committed himself to the offseason. You saw from the very beginning he was more physical, uh, more ready to play. And now you see a, a guy that has been maybe not a dominant figure, but certainly one of the guys you got to be concerned about on the other end. And I think he's really recommitted himself to where he was a non-entity at this time last year. Now he's somebody they really count on, both on the power play and five on five. Don, Giroux has not been great. He had that one goal in garbage time the other day, and he also has two assists. And some fans are kind of ripping his performance so far, but I think the, the Rangers have just done a great job defensively, so you've got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, but what's the voice of the New York fans on the job that the Rangers have done on Giroux, and, and what do they think about Giroux's performance so far in this series? Well, but they know that Giroux is the man. I mean, this is a guy that has a chance to win – MVP. You saw his slow start led to um, um, the coach getting fired, Laviolette. And once he started getting going, Philadelphia became a great team. And everybody focuses on making sure you shut down Giroux. 
Voracek is a good player. Simmons is a good player. But you know, Giroux is the guy you have to stop. So when you have that guy like that, that you know you have to stop, and you've got guys like Girardi and McDonough can focus on him, I think it's more of, hey, the, jo- the Rangers are doing a better job of shutting him down than, than Giroux not coming to play. And, and I'm with you. I thought Giroux played very well um, with the four shots on goal in game, four, uh, in game five. I thought, you know, you could say it was a garbage goal, but the way they're winning faceoffs in that game, when it got 3-2 with a minute and 31 seconds to go, believe me, Ranger fans were thinking that they were going to collapse and, and lose the game possibly in overtime. So that was a huge goal, and we'll see if that helps his confidence because I still think he's the most dangerous player on the ice. And I was one of those fans, but uh, real quickly, right before we let you run on the way out here with Don LaGreca, uh, as I was making that trek back from New York to Philadelphia, I was listening on the train, and I was hearing you on WLIE with our good friend, mutual friend, Mark Rosenman, and they said you had some indoor heated pool. Is that where you're going to be watching the game tonight? No, I'm going to be watching it at the studio. It's not indoors. It's in ground, and it's closed <laughs> because the summer hasn't started yet. So uh, that's just Michael K. getting his digs. And I find it interesting, Michael K. talking, getting in my pocket with my money. When he's got a penthouse in New York, he's got another house you know, uh, out in the country. So believe me, Michael K. is doing much better than I am. I can tell you that. Well, Dom, we appreciate a few minutes today. Thanks so much, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Uh, my pleasure, man. Great job. Don LaGreca right there from ESPN up in New York, 98.7 coast of the Michael K. Show. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be back to wrap up shop right after these short messages.